million. This here is kind of you know state of the art numbers. That one is obviously we've kind of uh, peeled it away some. This was going to be a great resonator, but then we were baking out the chamber and something fell and fell right onto these mirrors and left God knows what behind. Um, so we just decided to just put it back in place and not take anything apart, keep our fingers crossed. And uh, okay, so that meant that the total losses uh, turned out to be kind of large. Oops. Okay, so we wanted that to be smaller, but that's the size that it is. But what does that give us for these numbers? It gives us a finesse of 163,000 or a line width of uh, 1.8 megahertz. So, so much for the classical properties of one of these hyper pro resonators. I'll show you how, how we go about designing such resonators in first principles. What about their quantum properties? So, I have here the mode function of the electromagnetic field inside of the cavity. Now what I'd like to do is quantize it. So how do I do that? Well, um, you know, I'm going to write that the electric field is now an operator. And it's this uh, classical mode function, which I have to normalize at some point, times the field operators. I know that the electromagnetic mode and uh, density, sorry, the electromagnetic energy density for the classical EMM looks like this. I know how to get the magnetic field from the electric field, but we're just going to ignore that. We're going to just recall the fact that a typical electromagnetic wave like this one stores half of its energy in the electric field and half in the magnetic field. So we'll just let that be the case. The uh, Hamiltonian is the integral of the energy density. Not the following. And uh, we go ahead and take this integral. So we get, just take this first part, I get a uh, one half, uh, I have the integral of the electric field squared uh, dv. I have my raising and lowering operators. And this is the part that came from the electric field. If I add in the part that comes from the magnetic field, I get, I subtract out these pieces. Rid of. This here you recognize as 4 uh, C dagger C plus 2. And I want to get this thing in the form of uh, H bar omega times C, C dagger C plus a half. And then that tells me how it is I'm supposed to uh, normalize my electric field. Right? So I normalize it so that 2 epsilon naught times the integral of E squared. Now here I have a perfectly well-determined electric field, so um, I can keep going. So we'll go ahead and take this thing, square it, integrate it. I have to remember how to do Gaussian integrals. I have to pretend that I remember how to do Gaussian integrals. I always tell my students they're supposed to know Gaussian integrals in part. <laughs> Truth is I always go to mathematics. I think <laughs> for the life of you know what they are. And um, you end up with a definition that uh, the electric field this quantity E naught, in order to make this thing uh, properly normalized, would be uh, H bar omega over epsilon naught times, let's say, some volume. And by this volume, I mean pi over 2 times L times W0 squared. OK, so we have our hand. We've got a good handle on electromagnetic resonators and how to quantize them and how to use them for experiments. Any questions? From this number, you can already say what's the converting one, right? Probably would mention if they do. Yeah, from these numbers, you can already tell what the cooperative is. I'll get to that toward the end. Okay. Um, the, only, the only number that I needed for the uh, 
yeah, I needed the finesse and I needed the size of the mode. That's all I needed. Okay, good. So, so much for cavities. Uh, how about atoms? So we need, or we need a two-level system. So what kind of two-level systems do we think of using? Um, well, if you're a Steve Gerben, you think of this thing called a transmon. Right? Two pieces of superconductor with a junction between them. And you tune it so that the kinetic energy term is really big compared to the potential energy term. And that uh, uh, gives you a charge-like qubit, which is insensitive to charge noise, blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, so they got a transmon. <laughs> which I assume uh, Steve Gerben explained to you at that point. Um, you can, on these micro toroids, I suppose you can take some kind of uh, solid state two level object, like a, uh, uh, you know, an impurity metal inside of uh, glass or something, you know, like uh, neodymium inside of a piece of glass or something. Or uh, maybe these days you think about NV centers, which are not so great optically, but you can think about that as well. Or you can just use atoms. So we'll just skip all the rest of the stuff and go straight to uh, atoms. Let me tell you a little bit about atoms. I'm going to tell you about alkali atoms. And in particular, I'll tell you about uh, uh, my favorite atom, which is rubidium-87. So what does rubidium-87 look like? It's a complicated object, unfortunately. It's got a uh, nucleus which has uh, got a charge of 37 and has a uh, nuclear spin. And how it got that nuclear spin, I have no clue. Um, I do know that the number of neutrons on here is odd, so there's going to be some unpaired nucleons, so there's going to be some spin around. So that's going to be typically the case. So there's the spin of three halves for whatever reason it is. And then it's got 37 electrons hovering around, and uh, 36 of them uh, do us the favor of just forming sort of a closed shell core, which is relatively inert, although at the few percent level it actually participates in some of the physics. And it has no net angular momentum in this period. And then there's this one lone electron, the 37th electron, living out there as sort of the single uh, valence electron. So, to some degree, you think of rubidium or the other alkali atoms as being very hydrogen-like. Their physics is essentially that of a single electron atom if you neglect what's going on with the core. Okay, so we recall the, uh, uh, the spectrum of uh, hydrogen. Hydrogen has this uh, n equals one level, two, three, four, these are all filled. So the remaining electron, if it's going to live anywhere, it's going to be live in the n equals 5 shell. So here's, you know, n equals 5, n equals 6, and so on. Um, we recall from hydrogen that the s, p, d, whatever orbitals with the same principal quantum number all share the same energy. Okay, so that's what we'll be going on with hydrogen. Here's s, p, d. And here's where the close analogy between rubidium and hydrogen falls apart. Because the s orbital, let's say the 5s orbital, is one where the electron spends a fair bit of time near, near the nucleus. And near the nucleus, it sees that there's a pretty big charge, whereas when it's far away from the nucleus, it seems to see a screened charge of just one. So that particle is not moving in a very Coulomb-like potential. It's moving in a potential that gets very steep as you approach the, uh, the origin. In contrast, the uh, large angular momentum states of this valence electrons are of, this val of the valence electron are ones where the electron is very far away typically from the nucleus. And so it essentially always sees the screened Coulomb potential. And so for that guy, the energy is going to be very close to what you would expect it from hydrogen. Okay, so the end result is that these energy levels are pretty much what you would predict energy wise for hydrogen. And as you move in, they uh, tend downwards more and more. So that's kind of how the energy levels in rubidium look. And uh, this difference here is uh, pretty substantial. It's 1.6 electron volts, and it's nothing that I would know how to calculate. And it's just something you sort of, uh, well, you just measure or you send to some peers. It's not terribly important.
All right, so here, you know, I have basically a uh, krypton like core with a 5s electron, and here's the same core with a 5p electron, so on and so forth. So pretty much all of the uh, physics that's been going on with rubidium of late has to do with this transition, the 5s to the 5p transition uh, in rubidium, which turns out to be a fairly strong transition. Strong in what sense? It's strong in the sense that if I look at the dipole moment between this 5p level say, uh, some component of position times the electron charge, plus x. This thing is the dipole moment. Uh, this dipole moment of rubidium is supposed to be uh, about as big as it can be. In what sense? Uh, one typically looks at these uh, dipole moments, and never really quotes them directly, um, rarely this one, but rather one compares them to a, uh, a classical model of an electron on a spring. So now you're going to approximate that the atom, instead of having that kind of icky structure over there, uh, is actually one where there's a spring, and on the end of the spring, there's something with the mass of the electron charge of the electron. And uh, this spring is set so that it gives you the correct resonance frequency. Okay. Now it's pretty easy to go ahead and calculate the dipole moment, let's say, between the first excited state of this oscillator and the ground state. Uh, and it's just going to be E times the harmonic oscillator length. With this harmonic oscillator length, if you recall, it looks like this. So this is the classical dipole moment. This is the real dipole moment. And what you typically see in people's papers or in tables <coughs> is the ratio of these. One will typically talk about the actual dipole moment divided by the classical dipole moment. This thing defines something called the oscillator strength. Why go through all this? Well, because it turns out that oscillator strengths have certain sum rules that finally make some sense. And it turns out that if you have just one electron and you add up the properly all the dipole moments to all the possible states of the electron, the sum should be one. Um, okay, so we don't we don't have just one electron, we have lots of electrons, but let's pretend we just have one electron and all the oscillator strengths are going to be positive, so the biggest an oscillator strength could be for just one transition is one, and it sort of gobbles up all the oscillator strength for all of the possible transitions. And it turns out that in rubidium, this is pretty much true. So you can just take uh, these kinds of numbers and plot them in instead of taking actual values for things like the dipole moment, the other properties of the rubidium transition. Very handy. OK, so given that I'm just sort of postulating that the oscillator strength is one, now I've finally gotten uh, closed form expressions where I can tell you uh, what's the strength of the coupling of an atom to the cavity field. Right? So in the James Cummings Hamiltonian, there's going to be a term like this, right? The electric dipole coupling of an atom to the inside of one of these cavities. Okay? But now I know the strength of the dipole moment. And I just showed you what I just erased over here. I know the strength of the electric field, so I know how to take the product of them just given things like the experimental parameters. Okay, so the magnitude of this, d times e, is going to be something like uh, this classical dipole moment times the strength of the electromagnetic field inside of the cavity. Okay. 
this defines the cavity QD parameter of the coupling strain, G, which is the frequency. And I can just go ahead and put in numbers. So I run off to Mathematica before coming up with this lecture. And I find that this thing should be uh, 13 megahertz. Good, so nothing was swept under the rug. You know exactly if some experimentalist writes it down in this paper, and you happen to be a bunch of quantum optics theorists, you just take their word for it. But you can also actually check their numbers. You know what they're doing. The strength of this dipole moment here, which we related to this classical value, tells us not only how strongly does the atom couple to the cavity field, but it also tells us how strongly the atom couples to all the other electromagnetic fields. Which is to say I can now calculate for you the uh, spontaneous emission rate of my atom. I don't have to look that up either. Okay, so what's the idea here? <clears throat> now what we do is we imagine an atom that sits in a big box. And it's in the excited state. It's a big box now has some big old volume B, not the small one in my cavity. And uh, <clears throat> I find that this excited state is not uh, stationary. Uh, it's going to decay over time because it's coupled to a continuum of other modes. Right? So it's uh, coupled to a mode where now the box uh, has a ground state atom in it, and it also has a photon flying off in some direction. And there's a uh, coupling between these two, right? And we know what the dipole strength is, and we can imagine we can figure out what the electric field strength is too, given the size of the box B. It's a bit of a complicated story because uh, it's coupled to another state of the atom plus field. It's also coupled to a state where the atom is in the ground state, but, you know, I don't know, the photon is flying off in this direction. So there's a lot of states to which it's coupled. Well, that's fine. We're just going to sum over all those states. And the way, obviously, that we would calculate the, now the decay rate of this excited state is using uh, Fermi's golden rule. just to remind you of that formula. For every distinguishable output state, which is going to be defined by its, uh, uh, the direction of its k vector and its uh, polarization, there's going to be a decay rate. So I'm going to sum over all of these. And the decay rate is given by uh, the Hamiltonian coupling element squared times the density of states. That's the energy density of states as a Wait, sorry, so it's like gamma is equal to pi over gamma then so I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Where I said gamma equal to the H bar. <laughs> set of k's that fit inside that box, I do the usual rigmarole of taking that discrete sum, turning it into a continuous integral. Uh, so this becomes, there's going to be a, a volume over 2 pi q because of the density of states of these electromagnetic uh, modes. strength of the electromagnetic field squared, so that's not surprisingly going to be given by uh, this expression. Um, I have a sort of a polarization factor that I have to think of, given the dipole that's pointed in a fixed direction. This is just a geometric factor that I have to think about. There's the density of states, which is now taken as the delta function. not a terrible integral to uh, take. It turns out if I uh, work a little bit on this stuff, 
find is just something I get from integrating cosines times d squared. And uh, the integral here, I get, uh, I get uh, a k cubed on an integrate over that delta function. And we just do a little bit of calculus to get this result. So that's the decay rate, the spontaneous emission rate of an atom in free space, given its uh, dipole moment. Oh, I know what that dipole moment is because I'm thinking of my atom as essentially a classical electron on a spring, so that's not a secret either. So we can go ahead and approximate this. This is something like e squared, what was it, h bar over 2m omega. Uh, I get an expression for the decay rate which doesn't have any h bars in it, right? Because this h bar goes away against that h bar. Well, but that's not surprising because a classical electron on a spring that's emitting classical electromagnetic energy decays at a certain rate. I didn't need quantum mechanics for any of it. The only piece of quantum mechanics really that came in here was the fact that the atom had a particular structure which is different than an electron on a spring. That's the only vestige of uh, quantum mechanics in this whole calculation. Anyhow, I just put it in there. Actually, you know, that's not quite true because because if you had if you had a classical field, you would not have e would be zero. What would be zero? Oh, yeah. the way I did the calculation was using quantum optics. Right. But of course, I got the result that I would have gotten from a classical E and textbook of just ask, asking how rapidly does an electron on a spring damp out. Right. Yeah. Uh, but of course, the atom is not an electron on a spring. It's a two-level system, not a harmonic oscillator. So there's quantum mechanics. Well, great. So I can just plug in numbers. Great. I know the I know the frequency because I know the wavelength of the light I'm dealing with. I'll just put in classical values and see what I get. I get that the decay rate is two pi times five point eight megahertz. Wow! I never met a rubidium atom in my life. And look what its properties that I've calculated. So it turns out that uh, this is uh, off by about 3%. The actual value is 6 rather than 5.8. Because it, the, a real rubidium atom has some polarization of the core. So there's more wiggling around than just one electron. So that gives it a little more oomph when it tries to emit spontaneously. Um, and it's also true that the coupling strength to my cavity was off by but otherwise, without having met a rubidium atom, I did a pretty fine job already. Now, from all these ab initio numbers, let me just finish. From all these ab initio numbers, I've shown you what my mirrors look like, I measured the losses, blah, 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 and put it all back in rubidium. And we ended up deriving the fact that I have a cavity QED system where the single photon coupling strength, which recall was 2 pi times 13 megahertz, was uh, greater than the decay rate of the field, which was 1.8 megahertz, and of the atom. So that defines the strong coupling regime of cavity QED. What it means is that the atom uh, would rather cyclically exchange energy with the cavity field than lose the energy, uh, either out the cavity mirror or out into free space. So we've turned electromagnetic interactions of an atom, atom interacting with electromagnetic field, we've turned it into like a single mode problem from what it otherwise, you just saw this calculation was kind of a nasty multi-mode problem. That's why people love cavity QED. Another meaning maybe is the following. So imagine I have an atom here that would like to give up its photon. So it could, uh, it could send the photon out in any direction. So here's a sphere. Imagine this is like a screen and the photon could hit the surface of this spherical screen. So the atom could spontaneously emit in any direction. There's a tiny little bit of solid angle out here. 
which is the solid angle that's subtended by my cavity. That solid angle, if you just think about diffraction, uh, is roughly lambda squared over the cavity beam width squared. And I can imagine that the an atom, <coughs> the emission rate into uh, the cavity mode, what's it going to be? It's going to be the spontaneous decay rate times the fraction of solid angle that's covered by the cavity. So that's something like this. Forgetting the 4 pi. Um, but also the density of electromagnetic states in the cavity is enhanced because we have a cavity where right? all the modes are bunched up by the finesse. So times the finesse. The strong coupling condition is one where this thing is greater than the spontaneous emission rate. And it'll turn out that the this condition that G is greater than these guys, or rather that it's greater than the geometric mean of them, uh, turns out to guarantee this condition. That the atom would more likely now radiate its photon into the cavity than radiate it out into free space. You might be troubled by the fact that it seems like the uh, decay rate dropped out of this expression. It's over here and over here, so why does it play any role? It has to do with the fact that if uh, recall the spontaneous emission rate uh, when like omega over c squared essentially. So that's encapsulated by this wavelength in reality. Okay, you had a question? You Wow. <laughs> yeah, any other questions? Send them to me. <laughs> Uh, sure, well, I've been a little bit sloppy. So, in the, uh, in the, um, in the James Cummings Hamiltonian, uh, there will be a term which is like H bar G, uh, you know, uh, atomic raising operator, field lowering operator, plus conjugate. So that's the G that I've given you. Um, this is the half line width of the cavity. So if I measured, uh, if I just took the empty cavity and I measured its uh, transmission power, then the transmitted power would drop to uh, uh, half of its value at a, at, a, at a frequency cap. And I've given it to you here in cyclical, in uh, yeah, angular units. And this turns out to be the full decay rate. Um, so half of it would be half of it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, how is the coupling strength related to the uh, detuning? Uh, so, the coupling strength is not related to the detuning, but the shift of energy levels will be related to the detuning. Uh, I'll go over that, obviously, not today. I mean, I guess there's a bit of dependence on the fact that there's omega knots there instead of real omegas. So maybe things shift ever so slightly. But you sort of, there's complications with that. One is you just say, well, I'm never going to detune very far from resonance. Remember, it's like some relation with the frequency. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that tomorrow, what the energy shift is. Uh, Are there more questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, just sort of for curiosity, like, is, is this sort of parameter space like substantially better than what you get in like different realizations, like in superconducting circuits or stuff like that? Or it's, is it like unique in that sense? Or no? Yeah, it's unique in that it's actually really crappy. Okay. Uh, so the superconducting uh, qubits have really stolen the show in terms of single atom cavity community, I would say. So there, there was. Uh, for a long time, the motivation to do single atom cavity QD had nothing to do with optomechanics. It had to do with things like quantum, 
store a photon, re-emit the photon, you know, put a photon in, process it using the atoms, spit it back out, that kind of stuff. Um, and for decades, people have struggled to do that. And the holdbacks have been, darn it, the atom's moving. So we kind of figured out either that that's interesting or we figured out how to solve it. And the second is, darn it, these are not really impressive numbers. Uh, this cooperativity, which is the cavity QED cooperativity, which I guess is g squared over a 2 cap of gamma. Um, you know, this thing is like 10, 50. But it's not really big, and so if you think that that sort of quantifies how many operations I can do before things go bad, or maybe the square root of it is what quantifies it sometimes, that's not a really impressive number. And then along came uh, Sholkoff's work, and uh, first the strip line resonators, and now just the bulb resonators, and the uh, various qubits, finally the transmon, and you know now it's like 10 to the 4, so it's just off the charts. Uh, it's still just uh -huh. still just microwaves, so they're forced to do their experiments inside of cryogenic environments. I instead get to do my experiments inside of million dollar high vacuum chambers with single atoms that are really high hard to control. So. That still seems like rather than like negative to kind of hold them. Is there a positive to this situation other than that it's like a separate like experimental space? Or maybe it's easier, or is that All atoms are the same. Okay. So when it gets to putting lots of atoms in a resonator and using the resonator to cause them all to interact, make, making a many-body system out of a resonator with a bunch of atoms, that's going to be a much easier task than, uh, than with uh, superconducting systems. Because you don't have to actively stabilize each and everything. But you know, even that's starting to become possible. I mean, there are some improvements to the optical systems, right? There's this microtorid resonator has a much higher cooperativity typically because the mode volume is really small. But it only it only is useful if you can get an atom within like 100 nanometers of the surface, and we don't know how to do that yet. So, oops, that's too bad. And then there's different uh, cavities. Now, people can make uh, radius of curvature rather than five centimeters. They can make like 50 microns. And so now the modes get really narrow, and so that boosts up the, uh, the cooperativity because the mode width is really small. So, you know, I wouldn't give up on it. Okay, if we have no more questions, please thank Professor Stephen Kern again. Thank you.